find such men. We find them where we've always found them. In our villages and towns, on our city streets, in our shops and factories, and on our farms. We have come to be known to the ages as the greatest generation. And the men who served in the infantry as its band of brothers. This film is based on interviews with the men of the 42nd Rainbow Division. When my dad, Ralph Finseguera, a 24-year-old East Boston native, arrived in France as a brand new member of the 42nd Infantry, assigned to the 242nd Regiment with F Company, he was among thousands of replacement troops. These young men would boast of the depleted ranks of the 42nd which had sustained heavy losses of 50% of its fighting force. In the next 100 days, the Rainbow Division would lose many men in some of the most violent fighting of the Second World War, as they found themselves pitted against battle-hardened Nazi troops. And then, in the waning days of the war, the 42nd would arrive at the gates of hell, Dachau, the infamous Nazi concentration camp. This documentary is a tribute to the Rainbow Men of the 42nd and their remarkable endeavor known as the story of the Rainbow Trail and is dedicated to Ralph Vinciguerra who lived in Canton and was buried in Weymouth, Massachusetts along with his fellow soldier and friend Robert Davis of Oshkosh, Wisconsin and their fellow infantrymen. As Ralph said many times, the infantry is no picnic. I am proud of my combat inf infantryman's badge and proud to have served my country and do my part. Once before my dad died at the age of 90, I asked him to recall his time in the infantry during World War II. He asked, what would you like to know? He then started at the beginning, December 1944.
Along with the German advance into the Ardennes region of France in what was known as the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans also attacked the Allied forces in the Alsace on New Year's Eve in the village of Hatton and the forests of Hagenau. heavy artillery, and endless infantry troops. We were outnumbered two, three to one, so we were quickly repulsed. We lost lots of people. We were thrown back immediately. We were badly mauled, and it was demoralizing. Our baptism of fire, and it was a loser. Danforth Burris, 42nd Rainbow. Infantry. My most memorable experience, I believe, was when we had to withdraw because uh, the Germans outflanked uh, our particular group and uh, we had to pull back to straighten out the, the front. And uh, of course, Somebody had to be left behind to be rear guard while the rest of the troops pulled back. They pulled out at night so that try to cover our retreat so that the Germans would not know we were going and uh, counterattacked while we were had our backs turned, so to speak. Uh, my particular heavy machine gun platoon, along with uh, a few people from one of the rifle companies were left behind to protect the rear while the rest of the uh, battalion withdrew. And uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, tank destroyers, actually. They're, they're like a tank, a big, big gun on, mounted on tracks that had dug in around the area there, but it was in the wintertime and they uh, couldn't get out. They, uh, they would turn to mud and snowed and uh, had to be left behind and our instructions were to pour gasoline over these tank destroyers and to light fire to them so that uh, the Germans couldn't recover them. And so there we were standing uh, sort of all by ourselves with these uh, huge fires uh, all around us and uh, rather expecting uh, the whole German army to come over the hill at any time. And I guess I say, I don't know if that's my most memorable experience, but it's certainly one that's stuck in my memory. In an impossible battle, Private Vito Bertoldo, the 4F rejected army cook, turned true American hero and defied all expectations when he went above and beyond the call of duty to single-handedly defend his position 
on behalf of his country in the middle of the street for 48 hours Vito Bertoldo held off the German offensive alone. I think the movies have given us the impression that heroes are great big Rambo type people and that's not true. I think they're very tough committed people and tough doesn't necessarily mean big and strong. Tough means you don't give up. Dennis Reinhardt, U.S. Air Force, Vito Bertoldo's nephew. One of the captured German officers at Hatton later said that he had fought for three years at the Russian front and the resistance at Hatton was the most fierce resistance he had ever encountered. We were a tough generation. We all came from that tough era. Ideal for the combat infantry in particular. Combat infantryman lives in a hole in the ground, a foxhole, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The only thing between him and the enemy is the front side of his rifle. And he is the only man that actually comes into contact with the enemy, face to face. You better believe I'm proud to be a combat infantryman. Olin Hawkins. 42nd Rainbow Infantry. German tank officer who fought at Hatton said we were amazed the way your men fought. We always considered that you could defeat us only if you had a tremendous amount of tanks and armor. We believed that if we met you on equal terms we would have no difficulty. At Hatton we had the armor and the artillery and the experienced men. Your men were inexperienced and lacked tank and artillery support. Our officers said it was the best infantry defense they ever saw. Your baptism of fire was fast and furious, and in carrying out the mission of holding an important 7th Army sector against experienced German troops intent on regaining Alsace, you fought the powerful 10th and 21st Panzer Division and you and the troops who fought with you prevented these units from reaching their objectives. Brigadier General Linden, 42nd Rainbow.
Hitler's last offenses in December 1944 in the Ardennes region of Belgium and in January 1945 in the Alsace region of France marked the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. With these final attacks, Hitler had hoped to destroy a large portion of the Allied ground force and to break up the Allied coalition. The Ardennes Alsace battlefield proved to be no general's playground, but rather a place where firepower and bravery meant more than plans or brilliant maneuvers. Allied and German generals both consistently came up short in bringing their plans to satisfactory fruition. That American soldiers fought and won some of the most critical battles of World War II in the Ardennes and the Alsace region is now an indisputable fact. A typical 14,000 man division contained 81 rifle platoons fielding the 3,240 soldiers who first assaulted enemy positions. Here the division suffered from 70 to over 80 percent of their casualties. I love the infantry because they are the underdogs. They are the mud, rain, frost, and wind boys. They have no comforts, and they even learn to live without the necessities. And in the end, they are the guys that wars can't be won without. Ernie Pyle, American War Correspondent. The U.S. Army deployed 65 infantry divisions for World War II. Each was a small town with equivalent community services and eight categories of combat arms. Though artillery, engineering, and heavy weapons engaged the enemy directly, the foot soldier endured the greatest hazard with the least chance of reward. Except for the Purple Heart and the coveted Combat Infantryman's badge, recognition often eluded these common men become citizen soldiers because few remained to testify to the valor of the many. Nearly a third of these divisions suffered 100% or more combat casualties. Regimental staffs often saw their frontline units obliterated three to six times over. The worst experience of all is just the accumulated blur and the hurting vagueness of being too long in the lines, the everlasting alertness 
the noise and fear, the cell-by-cell -cell exhaustion, the thinning of the surrounding ranks as day follows nameless day. The constant march of one's own small quota of chances for survival. Those are the things that hurt and destroy. But they went back to them because they were good soldiers and they had a duty that they could not define. Ernie Pyle. February 14th, 1945. Hello, honey. I hope you're feeling fine on this Valentine's Day. I read about how cold it is back home with the blizzard and all. It's cold everywhere. The warm weather will be here soon. I hope. I'm sorry I can't send a little something from France. But where I am, baby, there ain't nothing except nothing. Love, Ralphie. A soldier who has been a long time in the line does have a look in his eyes that anyone with practice can discern. It's a look of dullness, eyes that look without seeing eyes that see without transferring any response to the mind. It's a look that is in the display room for the thoughts that lie behind it. Exhaustion, lack of sleep, tension for too long, weariness that is too great, fear beyond fear, misery to the point of numbness, a look of surpassing indifference to anything anybody can do to you. It's a look I dread to see on men. Ernie Pyle. With the Germans on the run, the 42nd and other members of the Allies were able to capture their first German town. Show now on March 18th, 1945. They would then begin their assault on Germany's defensive Siegfried Line.
planes bombed it, artillery shelled it, infantry and tanks assaulted it, and the Siegfried line was broken. Pete Hardy, 42nd Rainbow. As part of the 7th Army, the 42nd Rainbow were the first troops to reach the Rhine River. Patton's 3rd Army, however, was the first to cross 24 hours earlier. I drew an assault boat to cross in. Just my luck. We all tried to crawl under each other because the lead was flying around like hail. Western Union Telegram, April 7, 1945, 8.10 a.m. To Miss Irma Dolce, 79 Willow Court, Dorchester, Mass. Best wishes for a happy Easter. I am well and fit. Best wishes to all and good health. Ralph Vinciguerra. In the spring of 1945, combined Allied forces were poised to strike into Germany. After crossing the Rhine, the 42nd returned south into Bavaria, the heartland of Germany's industrial, agricultural, and economic might. Their main objective was to destroy the ball bearing factory in Schweinfurt, as well as the manufacturing cities of Würzburg. Nuremberg and Firth, and then on to capture Munich, the birthplace of the Nazi party.
the line moves on. They adjust the guys from Broadway and Main Street, USA. Ernie Pyle. In the initial attack, these cities were first bombed by Allied forces. Then the infantry advanced into the bombed out cities, fighting amid the rubble, engaging in heavy street by street fighting, the enemy forces retreating and many surrendering. The infantry, the goddamn infantry, as they like to call themselves. Their world can never be known to you, but if you could see them just once, just for an instant, you would know that no matter how hard people work back home, they are not keeping pace with these infantrymen in Germany. Ernie Pyle. As the Third Reich collapsed, President Franklin D. Roosevelt died. They took time to honor him. It was also Easter and Passover season, which was not lost on the men at the front, who were witnessing the true horror and devastation mankind is capable of, and many reflecting on their good fortune to be alive. However, we use the term liberate. Many people define liberate differently. But the American soldiers did free the camps. Do you look at yourselves as heroes? No. Um, I think that's what I was trying to imply when it started out, that uh, we weren't heroes. We were just uh, soldiers doing our job. and. Uh, we were we are proud of the job that we did but uh, a hero is somebody who does something beyond the call of duty yeah, i think you were a hero yeah it's there were soldiers all at, in 1940 there were soldiers all over the world doing what they considered their duty. And, uh, I don't think that we did anything more than the rest of them were doing, whether we were in Europe or Iwo Jima or Fulano Canal or wherever they were. We were marching through, chasing the Germans. It was getting close to the end of the war. The date was April 29, 1945. The sergeant came up and told us all to check our gas masks. We are going into a town that has a gas dump that's mined. So we proceeded to the town. It was Dachau. Part of our division, the 42nd Rainbow Division, 
had troops in the camp liberating it. At that time, we came to the main gate. They opened the compound, and I saw thousands of people crowding out that looked like skeletons. The skin stretched on them, then they were dirty. They smelled, some half dead. Suddenly we all realized what this war was all about. We now knew why we were participating in this war. James A. Rose, Toledo, Ohio, 42nd Rainbow. Second Division liberated the prison, but 33,000 inmates went wild with joy. Some yelled hysterically, but most just smiled. They knew that Americans were to find the sordid proof here that thousands of men, women, and children had been systematically murdered. They were weak and sick, but alive, and that was why they smiled. Seventy-five years ago, two people met on the day they were liberated from Dachau concentration camp in Germany. That day was April 29, 1945. 
They had survived horrors and had lost their entire families, hundreds of family between them, and they were far from the Polish towns they had been kidnapped from. The two formed a bond and decided to start a new family. A year after liberation, in 1946, Fred and Ann Gilbert married. They went on to immigrate to the United States and raise three children. They built a new life. Although Ann died in 2008 and Fred in 2009, their youngest daughter, Lena Gilbert, continues to tell their story. Dad had been in concentration camps for over five years, Mom over four years. They were both near death many times. Their sole survival technique was that they were determined to survive to be able to tell people what happened. As my mom would say, they survived knowing one day the hell would end and they would have their life again and they would tell the world what happened. Lena Gilbert. At 19 years of age, Private First Class Nachman Levy was the youngest of the Rainbow Division. As the youngest, the task fell to him to recite the four questions of Passover, which begin with the question, why on this night? Infantry Rabbi Bowen proclaimed, we have taken Bavaria from the Third Reich. 1,500 Jewish American soldiers cheered, and Nachman raised his cup and shouted, Laheim. When Munich was reached, entry into the city met almost no resistance. Thousands of Allied POWs and slave laborers cheered the troops, and German soldiers were ready to quit. Here, tank destroyers loaded with infantry roar into the city, while prisoners march out. Here we go again, here we go again, same old thing again, same old thing again, marching down the avenue, marching down the avenue, couple more weeks and we'll be through, couple more weeks and we'll be through, I'll be glad and so will you, I'll be glad and so will you. Am I right or wrong? You're right! Are we going strong? We're strong! Count off! One, two! Count off! Three, four! Break it on down! One, two, three, four! One, two, three, four! In their eyes as they pass is not hatred, not excitement, not despair, not the taste of their victory. There is just the simple expression of being here as though they had been here and doing this forever and nothing else.
sentimental journey Gonna set my heart at ease Gonna make a sentimental journey To renew old memories Got my bag, got my reservation Spent each dime I could afford Like a child in wild anticipation Long to hear that all of Weston Union Telegram to Miss Irma Dolce 79 Willow Court Dorchester, Massachusetts June 12, 1946 4.47 a.m. Honey, at La Havre, coming home, notify my mother, love always, Ralphie. Never thought my heart could be so yearning, why did I decide to roam, gotta take that sentimental journey. Sentimental journey home Sentimental journey When the war in Europe ended, the Rainbow had compiled an enviable record. It had completed 106 days of combat that began Christmas Eve, 1944. It had waged a heroic defense of Alsace and advanced 450 miles from the hot mountains of France in winter to the Austrian border. It had been the first unit into Germany, the first to penetrate the Siegfried Line, the first to cross the Rhine and Danube, and the first to enter Dachau and Munich. It had captured 51,000 prisoners and had always taken its objectives with a minimum of casualties. It ended the war, a first-class fighting team, fit to meet any enemy and destroy him.